I want you to open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is the uh, Sermon on the Mount. That's the series that we have been in for the last number of weeks until last week. And uh, last week, I shared some of the story that was unfolding in my life. If you weren't here last week, um, I told the church that uh, the preceding week, I had been in Southern California at uh, some meetings for the university that I graduated from, that I get to serve uh, as a, on the board of trustees um, as a part of the team there. And while we were there, there was uh, all the reports and everything that's happening at the school, but also some really smart people talking about what's happening in the world and the church at large. And the short story is um, th the world is really messed up. Um, and when you zoom in at the church in America, uh, it's, it's got a lot of issues. And when I say the church in America, I mean there's the church. The church is, the Bible says, the body of Christ. And the church is perfect. It's beautiful. It's, it's incredible. It's what Jesus died for. But when the church starts to take shape, it always takes shape in people, and every one of us are messed up. Wow, you were really comfortable with your amen. <laughs> but it's a true statement. And, and, and what's discouraging to me is the difference between the, the broken people that God builds into the church. That's beautiful. That's full of testimonies and miracles. And I mean, anybody here say, I've been broken and I'm a little less broken because Jesus has got a hold of my life. But so much of what we've seen in the last couple of years is, is not just that brokenness, it's the brokenness of lies and deception and pretenders and abusers and everything else that gets wound up in the midst of all of that. And, and it just, it, there's so much that's happened through the church in the last two years that doesn't look like the heart of Jesus. And all of that was going on in, the, in my mind, and, and I'm, I'm convinced of this reality, that God did not bring this church or any church through the last two years simply to say, September is coming, get ready to go back to normal. Now that everything's been shuffled and thrown up in the air, does God want us to fight for the status quo of what once was? Does God want you to fight for the status quo of what your, your relationship with him once was, what your relationship with people once was? I'm convinced that the answer is no. I'm convinced that God wants to do something exceedingly abundantly more than you could think or imagine, but that's going to require you to be willing to be something that you weren't. And follow Jesus in a new way. So that's where I was this last week. And the Lord took this great, really, really put together message that I had prepared on Tuesday of last week and a week before last. And kind of threw it out the window and said, I, I want you to do something else. And so that's where we ended up last week. And last week I talked to you about that place that the, the priests were in when God took the children of Israel across the Jordan River and the priests were the ones that carried the ark into the middle of the Jordan and then they stood there while everybody else passed by. And I began to think about how precarious of a situation that was for those priests. If you think about it, the waters were at flood stage and, thank you, sir. The waters were at flood stage, and yet the, God had held them up, up river, and the priests stand there while everybody else passes, and the, and the point of vulnerability is this. The priests had to stand in a position where if God didn't do what only God could do, they were going to get creamed. I like praying the prayers for God to do a miracle in somebody else in another part of the world so I can pray the prayer, say amen, and just go back to business. But they had to stand in the middle of a place where they were totally exposed and totally vulnerable, trusting God every second, every minute, every hour, while everybody else walked by. And the Lord said, that's exactly where I want you to be. 
And then God said to Joshua, I want you to take stones from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and I want you to build an altar of testimony so that in generations to come, when they say, what are that pile of rocks all about? You can say, that's where they stood. Not just that's what happened, but that's where they stood. And let me tell you about God's faithfulness while they stood. And that's where I believe the Lord wants to take you and me. That's where he wants to take the church. To a place that maybe feels vulnerable, it feels different, feels like, oh man, if God doesn't do a miracle in this situation, we're going to get creamed. Because those are the stories that are going to be told generations. Don't you want to be able to tell your kids, grandkids, nieces, and nephews? Not just, yeah, you know, we sang some songs and we went to church. But don't you want to be able to tell them about the wonders that you saw God do? So that was last week. If you didn't listen to it, you need to go back, listen to it, and watch it. So Monday comes. And guess what? I already have a sermon prepared. <laughs> it's so good. I mean, these are great weeks because I get to spend more time with people, some of the pressure's off. I'm diving in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and now it's a good message that's even better. And I called and was talking to one of my mentors, and I was asking what was going on, and in the midst of that, asked what I was preaching about this week, and I told him, and, and he knew about last weekend, and and uh, I said, yeah, so I'm going back to the Sermon on the Mount. And he said, oh, really? <laughs> and right then I knew my week was ruined. <laughs> and I almost dismissed it because I had a plan. And listen, I love to teach the Word of God. I love the Bible. It's changed my life. It's it's the only reason I'm standing today. But as I sat on that for a moment, I said, Lord, is there something else that you want to do? Because it's Thursday. I mean, I get it when you change things on Tuesday. <laughs> and this is what the Lord said to me. He said, don't for a second think that I'm going to let you get away telling everybody else to trust me and be vulnerable if you're not willing to live it yourself. <laughs> so your Bibles are open to Matthew chapter 5. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to Joshua chapter 6. <laughs> Can we do this? And, and I hope you hear my heart that there's nothing flippant about God's word. There's nothing flippant about the Sermon on the Mount. But, but church, I don't want us to miss for a second what God wants to do in this moment of time. And this message isn't so much about what God's doing in the church. This message is about what God's doing in you. Because if you don't capture what God is saying to the church and saying to you in this moment, then We'll have great messages, and we'll have a great moment, and we'll have something to talk about, and then we will just go back to the way things used to be, and you'll miss it. And I'm convinced God doesn't want you or me to miss this moment. So in Joshua chapter 6, beginning in verse 1, I'm going to read the first uh, 20 verses. It'll be on the screen as well. This is a story that maybe you've heard of it before. The story of Jericho. Now Jericho was shut up inside and outside because of the people of Israel. So they've crossed over, built the testimony. I spared you from the circumcision sermon. That happened. They celebrate Passover. Joshua has an encounter with the commander of the Lord's army. And now they're preparing for their first battle as they enter into the promised land. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands. Listen, that is the first thing. It's not in my notes, but that is the first thing that God will do to mess you up. The walls 
were as fortified as walls could be. And yet God says to Jericho, see, I have given you the city. There is no way Joshua could see that with his physical eyes. God was asking Joshua to see with the eyes of faith that the victory was already his. And loved ones, you got to start believing that too. That if God says, I've given you the city, then before any wall comes down, you begin to believe that the eyes of faith will tell you a truer story than the eyes of fear. With its king and mighty men of valor, you shall march around the city, all the men of war, going around the city once. Everybody say once. once. Thus you shall do for six days. Seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. And on the seventh day, you will march around the city seven times in the priest shall blow the trumpets. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with the great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every one straight before him. So Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, take up the ark of the covenant, and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, go forward. March around the city and let the armed men pass on before the ark of the Lord. And just as Joshua commanded the people, the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward, blowing the trumpets. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them, with the ark of the Lord following them. The armed men were walking before the priests who were blowing the trumpets, and the rear guard was walking after the ark while the trumpets blew continually. But Joshua commanded the people, don't shout. Or make your voice heard. Neither shall any word go out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shall shout. Everybody say shout. shout. So he caused the ark of the Lord to circle the city, going around it once. Everybody say once. once. And they came into the camp and spent the night at the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord, walked on. And they blew the trumpets continually. And the armed men were walking before them, and the rear guard was walking after the ark of the Lord, while the trumpets blew continually. And the second day they marched around the city once. Everybody say once. once. And returned it to camp, so they did it for six days. On the seventh day, they rose early at dawn and marched around the city in the same manner seven times. It was only on that day that they marched around the city, se everybody say seven. seven, seven times. And on the seventh time, when the priests had blown the trumpets, Joshua said to the people, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Only Rahab the prostitute, side story, you have to read earlier to understand that. But you keep yourselves from the things devoted to destruction, lest when you've devoted, take any of the devoted things. In other words, here's the point. There were ten cities that they were going to conquer. The first one, God said, all of it belongs to me. By the way, this is the pattern. This is the pattern of, for anybody. It's all throughout the Old Testament and the New, that the first always belongs to the Lord. Because you don't learn to trust him when you always have a scarcity mentality and when there's one chicken leg on the table, you take it for yourself, saying, I don't know if any more is coming. When you offer the first to the Lord, you're saying, Lord, I'm trusting you for the rest. So that's what they were doing. But all the silver, all the gold. and the, So verse 20, so the people shouted and the trumpets were blown and as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat. Everybody say flat. flat. The people went up straight before them and captured the city. The picture that I want you to paint is one that echoes what we learned last week. And that is that God had a miracle that he was going to perform for the people. But the people's role in the miracle looks awfully counterintuitive to what actually would be required to accomplish the task at hand. In other words, if you were going to say, we need to cross that river, then any, any 
somebody with a modicum of intelligence would say, okay, bridge or boat, we're just going to throw the small people across and swim. You start figuring it out, how this could work. But that's not how God did it. Now they come to this impossible city, this impenetrable city, and once again, God says, I'm not going to do it with your swords, your bows, your arrows, your catapults, your trebuchets. I'm not going to do it with your batter, battering rams or fire bombs or firecrackers or anything else. I just want you for six days to march around the city one time blowing the horn. No words. Just the trumpet. And for six days, they march around the city one time. And I would have to imagine that the priests that were standing in the water of the Jordan, the, 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 the dried up riverbed of the Jordan, marching around the city are thinking, God makes no sense to me. Anybody ever thought God makes no sense to you? But I want to suggest that there are walls in every single one of your lives between where you are today and the promises that God wants you to apprehend for your tomorrows. Maybe it's faith. Um, maybe it's freedom from addiction. Maybe it's a way that you so desperately want to see yourself the way God sees you, but you always see yourself smaller. You always see yourself less than. You always see yourself as a victim of the past. God wants you to see you in light of who he's made you to be. All of those things are walls between you today and you where God wants you to be. And you and I can't be the church that God wants us to be and has made us to be if we are a bunch of individuals that are all walled off from the very promises that God has made provision for you. So those walls have to come down, and I believe that today God wants to bring those walls down in your life. And there are three things I see. Number one, to be the kind of person that walks around the wall, they're going to come fast and hot, so catch it, write it down. The first thing, if you want to see the walls come down in your life, you, you have to deny yourself and live for Jesus. Listen to the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny. Everybody say deny. deny. Himself and take up his cross daily. Say daily. daily. And follow me. Why does this matter so much? Because the very thing that the priest did to every day lay down their agenda, and instead do what God had asked them to do, required them to do the very thing Jesus said is fundamental to being a follower, to being a Christian. You deny yourself and take up your cross. How often? And here's, here's where I think this hits home. So often, have you ever looked at the challenges in your life and said, God, when are you going to take these challenges away? Anybody felt that way? Anybody identify what that challenge looks like? Maybe that challenge is something in you that you want changed. Maybe that challenge is something around you that you want to go away. Anybody ever had a neighbor that's a challenge? Anybody ever had a boss that's a challenge? Anybody ever had a friend, a spouse, a family member that's a challenge? Maybe you've been single far longer than you wanted to be single, and you're thinking, is it me or is it everybody else? But this is a challenge. Maybe you just got diagnosed with something that makes your head spin, and you're thinking, this is the challenge, God. Won't you make it go away? But here's the thing I think God wants you to begin to think about it's not just, God, how quickly can you remove this challenge from my life, but ask God this question. God, what are you using this challenge to remove from my life? Instead of, God, make it go away, say, God, what does it look like for me to deny myself and take up my cross daily 
to follow you in the midst of this. Maybe that frustrating boss is exactly the antidote to your pride and selfishness because you're going to have to humble yourself to show up to work and say, yes, sir, <laughs> I'd love to do that for you. Or, or, or to look across the street at your neighbor and say, God, you know what? I take back those prayers for fire and brimstone. <laughs> and now I'm asking that your peace would reign and rule in their home. Do you get it? Something in you needs to die so that Christ can live. I want you to watch this testimony of what happened in somebody last weekend as they basically said, God, I'll die so you can live. You guys ready with this? Watch this. Hey, Living Water. Um, last Sunday, God was doing a really powerful work in a lot of us. We talked about God's invitation to stand in a vulnerable place and trust him and let let him bring from that place of vulnerability the ingredients for for an altar of testimony and uh, i'm with a friend that i saw being impacted by the holy spirit in what looked like a significant way and so i approached you on sunday and what you shared with me was really impactful to me and i wanted to share it and so what was going on in you at the altar? Uh, yeah. Uh, First of all, who are you? <laughs> uh, my name is Justin Wimberly. Uh, me and my wife, Kelsey, have... Uh, I've been here since I was a kid, for about 25 years, uh, at Living Water. And uh, my wife, Kelsey, and I have three girls and one on the way. And so... Um, yeah, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> Never a dull moment. Never a dull moment, has. yes. And, uh, and what do you do? Yeah, we own a gym called Wimberly Training that we've had for almost six years. June, actually this week will be six years. And uh, so that's what we've been doing for um, uh, work and serving our community that way. So uh, Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. So uh, I, I don't know. It was a, it was a moment... Uh, worship was really good and uh, the word was really good and then you, the time mm. were really, <laughs> really good yeah but it was really it really took me in because it wasn't it wasn't a um, I mean there wasn't like a ton of scripture to, to the word it wasn't it was more of like a it was like a challenge in a sense and or for me at least and uh, so the when we had kind of the altar call time or the you know response time I just I just sat there. You asked everyone to stand, and I just sat there, and I just allowed the Lord to just work in me. And uh, as I was just sitting there, <laughs> I get emotional. Uh, as I was sitting there, I was just fighting with the vulnerability of getting up and uh, letting that letting people know, I guess, that I'm dealing with something or I'm walking through something or I'm being pushed. And uh, and I just, like I told Pastor John, I, I had, it was like someone just lifted me out of my seat and took me to the front. Uh, what happened there was just uh, the Lord just softening my heart. You know, as a, as a man, I think sometimes vulnerability is a hard thing to, to, to uh, to work through and to grow in and still growing in and uh, especially with four girls and my wife. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, it, it was just an opportunity for the Lord to just start opening up um, an area that I think uh, needed to be addressed. And the big thing that was just spoke to me and I said, Pastor John, was that you're passionate about all these things in life, that'd be politics or uh, businesses staying open or whatever, people's decisions. I mean, and everything in the last two years has impacted you in a really personal way. It has, right? yeah. I mean, COVID and then all of the overflow of that. So this is really your life, yeah, right? So, and you've had passionate feelings yeah. about that. Yeah, and I've, I have passionate feelings and I, 
Um, I feel strongly because I felt like I was pushed into a corner, you know, with, you know, business being shut down and just trying to put food on the table for my family. And, uh, and I, so I just, and I'm passionate about it, all these things. And the Lord just said, well, why aren't you just as passionate for me? And say that one more time. <laughs> the Lord asked, why aren't you just as passionate for me? Why aren't you standing up more for me, you know, and fighting for me or, you know, yeah. And that being said, we we're also watching the show, The Chosen. And, and I just, just thinking of the disciples and just being like, you know what? Okay, I'm gonna follow you, Lord, or I'm gonna, I'm just gonna stand up and I'm gonna believe even when I don't see it. And uh, so that's what. What, what I was so impressed with, Justin, is you did it. Like you stepped into that moment of vulnerability in a pretty significant way. And I don't know what the Lord's gonna do with that. I don't either. <laughs> but I know this, you didn't miss the moment. And the best that you knew how, you positioned yourself to possess the promise by responding to the Lord in that way. Yeah. And I'm so proud of you, and I'm so humbled to be a part of a church with men like you and people like you, because I think if we may not be the smartest people, we may not be the flashiest people, but man, if we'll be that vulnerable and responsive to God, anything's possible. Yeah. You want to leave us with something? Yeah, I just have a verse that, um, I, it, it's number six, uh, verse 24 through 26, and it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, like John said, I, I, you didn't miss the moment. And when the, in that moment too, you know, it was an opportunity to go, you know what, Lord, I don't, I don't know what you're dealing with with me. I don't know, but I know you want me to be passionate for you and you want me to profess your name and you want me to um, just stand firm in, in you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but with that, I think the Lord wants to bless people when they do that. And I think he wants to shower that on them. Um, I think the Lord wants to bless everyone, but I think when we decide to be vulnerable like that, he, his blessings are far beyond. And like I said to John before this, it it may not be when I'm alive still. It might be for my kids. It might be for my grandkids. So, but I didn't want to miss it. I don't want to miss it either. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for being an example to us. Yeah. That's the real deal. That's the real, imagine if every one of us were willing to say that. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. May I be as passionate for you as I have been about every other thing that matters to me in this life. Amen? You have to deny yourself. The second thing is simply this. You, you have to embrace your vulnerability as God's opportunity. You saw it in Justin. To embrace your vulnerability as God's opportunity, let me leave you with this scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 through 31. The Apostle Paul, who had a resume of all resumes, if there was somebody who could rely on his strengths to validate what God did in him or through him, it was Paul, but listen to his testimony. For consider your calling, brothers. This is verse 26 of chapter 1. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God, say that. But God chose the, what is foolish in this world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. That doesn't mean that God's just walking around using knuckleheads, or that somehow we should boast in our ignorance. That's not the point. But listen, here's the point. When you take all of that and deny yourself and take up your cross 
daily to live for him, then he uses all of your lack for his glory. And we live in a world that says, you know, the people who are really making a difference are the influencers. The ones who can bolster their image to be attractive to others. But listen, God's not interested in making you an influencer. He's interested in making you influential for his glory. And the pathway to that is often your vulnerability, not your image management. Not other people's opinion, but your identity in Christ. You have to embrace your vulnerability as God's opportunity. And then here's the final thing. I'm going to invite the worship team to come to the platform. Uh, You have to take ownership of your place in the mission of God. See, that's where these priests and soldiers had to find themselves, was that God had a place for them to play. He had a role for them to play. And as, as you as an individual and as we as a church cross over this this 2020 Jordan River into whatever God has for the future. It may look different. It may feel different. But this I know to be true. There's a place for every one of you, and it's not on the sidelines. Let me say it again. There's a place for every one of you in the mission of God, and it is not on the sidelines. Let me say it again. There is a place for you in the mission of God. And it is not on the sidelines. Far too long. There's a fascinating study. If you look back at the church in America over the last 50 or 60 years, one of the things that made, there's a shift that happened in the, early 1900s and another in the 40s and 50s. In the 40s and 50s, what redefined the way church would operate in the United States was the prevalence of the automobile. Because as soon as more people got automobiles and could drive outside of their community to go to church, churches started to get the idea, we should be more attractive so that people will wanna drive to us. So what services can we offer can we make our music a little bit better? Can we have more classes? Can Now, all of these are good things, but do you see the point? We, and Americans begin to think, I, I should have options. I don't just want, you know, Henry, Henry Ford's Model T. I, I want an upgrade. And so in the 60s, in the, seven, in the 70s, There was a revival that swept the West Coast. I don't know if you've heard of it. The Jesus Movement messed up the West Coast and and much of the nation. And it filled churches. Huge churches were built like never before. And after these huge churches were built out of this moment of revival, leadership realized now that the churches are full, we got to keep the lights on. Now, I'm not criticizing churches with buildings or churches with lights. I kind of like lights. But I am saying this. Most of you have lived in an environment here in the United States where this is what church has meant to you. And you, we use phrases like church shopping. You ever heard this? I'm going to go church shopping which is kind of like I'm going to go spouse shopping. I'm going to go father shopping. I'm going to go mother shopping. I'm, now, if you've said it and if you're here at church shopping, you know, sorry. <laughs> but if you, if you come to church with that mentality, let me find the one that offers the goods and services that I want, then your sense of connection is only as good as your desires are being satisfied. That's where it breaks down. Because that's not a picture of a body. It's not a picture of 
community. It's not a picture of authentic relationships. Authentic relationships are born in the trenches when you're not giving me what I want and yet I choose to stay. And that's who Jesus is. That, that's what Jesus did. He said, let me demonstrate love to you by coming to those who are actively rejecting me and yet giving them everything. And so why does the world look so suspiciously at the church? The reason is the church looks nothing like the founder of the church, Jesus. And please hear my heart. I'm not criticizing you or Living Water or Baptists or I'm, I'm not, I'm just saying this is the, this is the air that we've been breathing here for the last 40 years. And the last two years have been a wake up call to say, let's recapture something that's always been at the foundation, but maybe has gotten muddled along the way because of all the extra, all the attractive stuff. Here's the encouragement. Jesus said to Simon Peter, who do men say that I am? He told him, and then Jesus asked Simon Peter, who do you say that I am? And Simon said, you are Christ, the son of the living God. And he said to Peter, on this rock, pointing to himself, Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. See, the good news is, if you'll sign up to that reality that Jesus is the son of the living God, he's at the center of it all, and allegiance to him is the thing that matters more than anything else, loving him with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, denying yourself, taking up his cross daily to follow him, being willing to step into those vulnerable places so that it's not you that gets the glory, it's he that gets the glory, so that from those places, Altars will be built to tell the story of what God did in this moment, in this generation. See, Jesus has not stopped building his church, but he's awoken us to the reality that maybe we've been busy building some things that aren't, and he wants us back on his team. He wants us back on his team. He wants you. Now listen, he wants you. And so if there's something in you that's been a come to church on Sunday, see what they have to offer, kind of a Christian, he wants to take you so much deeper. He wants to show you so much more. He wants you to know that you never were the initiator in this journey relationship. He's been coming after you and coming after you and he wants those walls to come down so that you can see him and know him and you can be a part of this incredible thing that he's doing in this moment of time. And the question to you is, will you say yes? The question to you is, will you say yes to him? And the question to you is, will you say yes to him every day? Because if you will, when you do, the walls will come tumbling down. Do you believe that? Yeah, I do. I believe it so much. that I think God wants to mark this moment. And so instead of an altar call, I want to ask you if you want to go for a walk. And you put yourself in the shoes of those priests who had to deny themselves and make themselves vulnerable and be a part of what Jesus was up to, not their own agenda, so that he could be glorified and the walls would come down. 
So I'm asking you, instead of coming to the altar, would you go for a walk? Would you do something so silly to walk out those doors and to walk around this building and say, God, I know it's foolish and I know it's symbolic and yet it is my response to you to say yes to everything that you're asking and saying, will you bring those walls down in my life? Will you bring everything that holds me back and keeps me from stepping into all that you have for me? Will you bring them down by the power of God like those walls came down in Jericho? And then will you use me to be a part of this thing called the church that you've been building for 2,000 years? So will you Open your heart to what God wants to say as we silently, but faith-filled, hopefully, go for a walk. And if you can't navigate the sidewalks or the stairs or you just stay and the worship team is going to play, and I don't know if two people or everybody wants to do this, but this isn't for me and it's not for the church. It's for you and the walls that God wants to bring down in your life. So you can stay if you want, if you need to, but if anybody wants to say yes to that in this way, then we're going to go for a walk.
This is my confidence. You never fail me. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness still in your hands this is my confidence you never failed me yet I pray over every individual, every person. 
that today took a stand of faith to trust and believe that what is impossible for man is possible for God. And that it is not by might, not by power, but it's by your spirit that you make a way where there seems to be no way. And so we speak to every bit of doubt and every bit of sickness and every bit of rebellion and arrogance and divisiveness and in the name of Jesus we declare the walls are coming down where there's there's broken dreams where there's hopelessness the walls are coming down in Jesus name and now awaken your church to see with your eyes and to love with your heart that there would be less of us and more of you. And I pray in Jesus' name that you would seal in the hearts of every man and every woman that today is not the culmination, it's not the end, but it's the beginning of entrance into a more promise-filled future in Jesus Christ. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everybody say, if you believe it, say amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Now may that promise that you heard earlier be yours. May God bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift his countenance towards you. And listen, in his presence there is fullness of joy. And may he give you peace to be who he's created you to be and to live in the promise that he's made available to you in Jesus Christ. God bless you. Be an encouragement to one another and go be the church. That's who God's made you to be.